good morning. That was an excellent talk, and I could really see that some of my information kind of piggybacked off of what they brought up in that, um, some of those evidence based guidelines. So I'm Mark Griffiths. I'm one of the PCM docs at CHOA, uh, Children's of Atlanta at Emory. Uh, we have three campuses that work with two of them. Uh, and this is a timely talk because we're seeing a lot of influenza going on. Our volumes are upwards of 50 to 70 percent above what our target was around this time of the year. So we're seeing a lot of respiratory cases. So hopefully some of this information will also be helpful to you as well. I have no disclosures, and um, the goal of this talk is to really talk about the management of the most common things that we see at show up, um, to give you some evidence-based updates on the treatment strategy for these kids, as well as to kind of take you as best prepared as possible for the next batch to get the respiratory cases by. So we'll start off with this little vignette. We got an eight-month-old who was previously healthy, now coming in to the ED with two days of coughing, runny nose, and feeling feverish. Didn't have the thermometer at home. Started daycare last week. Also has a four-year-old sister that loves to give him lots of kisses. Uh, parents have tried the little squeezy thing they gave us at the hospital when he was first born, and of course we're talking about this. If you've ever opened this thing up after about 30 days of its use, it's quite disgusting and pretty thick and not getting much out. Uh, so it wasn't helping, and so they brought him in for further evaluation. So this kid most likely has bronchiolitis. I can't really zoom in here, but there's a pathophysiology screen on that top right side. And it shows not only are you seeing the uh, inflammation go on, the lumen itself is kind of swollen up and, and, and getting congested, but it's actually necrosis of the epithelial lining there. So this might have started off as a simple cold, but now something much more than that. So bronchiolitis, it's the most common respiratory illness we see in children under two years of age, usually under 18 months. And for us at our hospital, it accounts for at least one in five admissions, usually between October and March. Um, typically, be, typically begin with that URI prodrome that we were talking about before, and then we start developing the typical wheezing and respiratory distress. Parents will say sometimes that the symptoms are worse at night. And uh, one thing that's really important to know for yourself and also to tell the families is that what you see now might not be what you see in two days. The good thing about bronchitis is that it has a pretty reliable disease pattern where you have an increasing amount of symptoms over the first few days, then you kind of plateau and then gradually decline. I would say over the last two years, though, I've been seeing some particularly virulent strains of RSV, adenovirus, and influenza. So the kids coming in day four or five that you expect them to be over the hump are still kind of chugging away to end up in the ICU. And the important thing to tell the families too is that this is gonna last, at least with some URI symptoms for several weeks. I didn't believe it until one of my daughters um, had the URI symptoms for literally five weeks after she got over the rough patch. And uh, it's, it's one thing to experience it for yourself. It's quite annoying. So you got mild bronchiolitis. This is gonna be most of the kids. Um, these kids come in with maybe some tachypnea, so 40s and 50s. And remember, pediatrics, that's not too bad, right, for these little five-month-olds. They might have some nasal flare, but most don't. Might have some grunting, but most don't. And then some subcostal retractions. So the most minimal of the retractions. And then wheezing and rock back throughout. Feeding-wise, they, they usually go pretty well. So if they're usually drinking four ounces, they're taking maybe three or four ounces. Uh, so probably their full amount. And generally, they look well. They're smiling, they're interactive, and that's where they get that name, the happy beavers. I tell families all the time, your child sounds like they've been smoking Newports, but he looks good. So everything is good. <laughs> So what's noticeable from the last slide? This is the usual testing we do for these kids. I want you to burn that image in your mind. What's, constant, what's um, significant is that there's no mention of any labs or imaging. And that's a, a point of um, emphasis from the AAP, the American Academy of Pediatrics. And that was a statement that came out in 2014 that says we really want to focus on the clinical diagnosis, not so much on doing those tests. Reason for that is we want to save time, it's a lot of effort, as well as a dollar that you're spending on that. And in this age of high deductible payment plans and everybody's nitpicking, you really want to cut down on your negative uh, feedback for uh, not doing anything for me, but I have this thousand, multi thousand dollar bill. You can skip doing the x rays, you can skip doing the RSV testing because it's not going to change your magic on these happy, well aware children. What you want to do for them, though, is you want to suction, suction, mm -hmm. and suction. All right, these noses are running, and parents, like I said, are trying to bulk suction, but it's really operator dependent. I've had uh, two kids go through bronchiolitis, so I'm quite good with the bulk suction now. But if you don't get the angle just right, if you haven't occluded the other nose just the right amount and, and you know pulled it out just the right speed, you're not going to get as much out of it. So we do deep nasal suction using either an 8-French or 10-French catheter, and then the nasal hub suction. I did residency in Ohio, and we used to call it the big booger getter. And so it's these hub ones that are there that you hook up to the suction device, 
and you can get some honking and satish inside these kids. And then there are a lot of commercially available ones too, which are amazing. Um, I have a one-year-old son now, and uh, last, I guess, yeah, last year around this time, he was going through his uh, bronchitis spiel, and then I bought one of the over-the-counter ones, and I felt like I could suck out his soul with that thing. That thing was <laughs> so I definitely, definitely, I can't, I'm not gonna, you know, declare for any one product, but something like that definitely helps. If there's a family history of any atopy, then albuterol netrol is something you can try. It's only gonna help really realistically about one in five kids. Um, I feel like in, in Atlanta, especially, everybody either has asthma or is related to somebody that has really bad asthma, so I try it on almost everybody, um, but don't expect it to help everybody. And then in terms of who can go home, since this is part of the mom case that we're talking about, most kids are gonna qualify for discharge home. And we have pretty set criteria at our hospital. They have to have respiratory less than 60, saturated than 91% as they were mentioning from the studies before. Um, and then uh, if the respiratory improvement, that simple suction, whether it be the pulse or the nasal hook suction. And then we try to do an oral intake challenge to make sure they can drink at least half of what they normally drink. Every once in a while though, that mild can turn into a moderate. So with these kids, they look a little bit different, right? They're gonna be breathing a little bit faster, upwards of the 70s, they might have uh, nasal flaring and grunting, and then they'll have more of those um, significant attractions, the intercostal, subcostal, as well as the supersternal. They will probably have the wheezing going on in the bronchi as well. <clears throat> and their feeding is usually diminished, so if they're usually taking four ounces, now they're down to two. Sometimes they'll be smiling and tacking away, uh, but a lot of times they're very irritable, but can be consoled by their provider. The one thing you want to look out for, and that's why I have the red slide there, if the parents tell you this is not their child, listen to them. Um, they know what they're like at baseline, and that's like your warning flag to, to take this uh, a little bit more seriously than probably you had before. So the same steps, initially you're gonna suction, and like I said, you can try the bulb suction, but at this stage, I just jump straight to the nasal hub suction or the deep suctioning. With these kids, um, you can once again try out B-roll if that family history of asthma, but a lot of times I'll just jump straight to the ischemic epinephrine. And then once again, if they look good after all of that, then you can use the same discharge criteria and give the family the caveat that if anything worse, feel free to come back. Uh, but if they don't, then you know, time to admit. In terms of racemic epinephrine, it's a mixed alpha and beta agonist, and the reason it works is it's thought to lead to both vasoconstriction as well as reduction of the edema. And then you'll see, if you look at any of the websites, especially the children's uh, hospital websites that have the algorithms posted, the, child, the children's of Philadelphia and Seattle children's are really good, posting their algorithms. You might see some conflicting data as you go um, through the different ones. And that's because the, the, uh, the studies aren't really great yet. The Canadian study showed no difference between RAC, FE, albuterol, and <clears throat> excuse me, placebo. And there's a Spanish study that recently came out that showed that there is improvement and you can find everything in between. So it's not great. So I say, should you try it? Absolutely. At worst case scenario, it won't help. Best case scenario, it would change the disposition. I literally have had kids <clears throat> excuse me, who I thought were destined for the ICU, I gave them a dose of ischemic epinephrine, and they look so good, but I still feel nervous about sending them on solid into the regular floor. Or some kids that I'm sure that were needing to be admitted to the regular floor, I gave them the ischemic epinephrine, and I watched them for two or three hours, and they look phenomenal. <clears throat> They're looking at me saying, can I go home? You know, that kind of look. And so um, I'll be able to send them home. And I call the families back a day or two later, and they say, no, he's doing great. So I always try ischemic epinephrine if they have any issues. Moderately ill children, though, that need to be admitted, um, you need to be staying on top of what their needs are in terms of frequently suctioning them, uh, frequently giving their bronchodilator therapy. So if they improve off the receiving epinephrine, and I'm calling up to the Gen Peace team, and we have you know, a pretty robust pediatric program, I'll stretch to the residents on inpatient and make sure the RT is giving this receiving epinephrine every two hours because this kid really responded well to it. And then supplemental O2. So we'll give that either during a simple nasal cannula or high flow nasal cannula. And that can be either for the hypoxia, or sometimes they just need that slow descent to open their airways. In terms of fluids, um, these kids sometimes, if they're uh, breathing too fast, then they, they really aren't interested in eating, and you don't want them to get dry on top of uh, their insensible losses that they already have. So we'll start them on IV fluids almost all the time. Uh, there are a few institutions that are pushing more for NG feeds, um, so that's another option if you have there. The big thing is with these moderate kids, if you have any thoughts about sending them home, just realize what you're dealing with. This is a very frustrating disease for the family. 
you know, they, there's no silver bullet for them. It takes a lot of therapy at home. I was suctioning my son every two, three hours on the clock. I just had an alarm on my phone and I was, I was like militant with it. Uh, but for most people, that might be too much for them to handle at home. Because we have to also remember, you take care of the most vulnerable in our population, right? These kids can't care for themselves. Some of them can't even hold their head up, right? Because they're so young. And so if you get any vibe from the family and your spidey sense is going off and says, I don't really trust this family, just admit it. Of course, <clears throat> anything can progress to severe. And those kids, those are obvious when you see them. They're tacking away. They're breathing 60s, 70s. I had a child one time breathing 95 times a minute. It was, it was scary. Um, they've got warm nasal flaring, they're grunting, they've got contractions throughout. And then sometimes you're not even gonna hear the wheeze or the run back because they're so tight and clamped down. Their free eating is almost nil. Um, sometimes they'll drink an ounce or two, but really they're not drinking much. And they can span anywhere from being very irritable to not interactive at all. And so with these kids, I just bypass step one. We're just gonna start with the suctioning and then try to give a little bit of respiratory support with a little glycemic epinephrine while I'm calling my RT to come get some more supplies for me. If they're in moderate distress after suctioning, you can kind of temper them out a little bit, then I might do the, the high flow nasal cannula, but if they're in impending respiratory failure, I just go ahead and proceed with intubation. So high flow nasal cannula, I was surprised. I mean, I've done my uh, pediatrics residency and then did a fellowship afterwards, so I wasn't as familiar with the adult uh, respiratory <coughs> treatment strategies. We've been using high flow nasal cannula forever, it seems like, in, in pediatrics, and there's been several spinoffs of that, like bubble CPAP and grand cannula and things like that. But this high flow nasal cannula is great. <clears throat> we generally suck them at around four liters per minute if they're under a year, six liters per minute if they're a year or older, and then we check the gas 30 minutes later. You can either do venous or cap gas. Our pulmonologists use light cap like that says to make it more accurate. And then, <clears throat> excuse me, we'll go up to as high as 12 liters per minute on the little ones, up to as high as 20 liters per minute in our piggies. And this can sometimes um, take away the need to actually intubate the child if we can get them temporized uh, with the high flow nasal cannula. Of course, sometimes that's not enough, and if you have to go ahead with the intubation, then high flow is actually a good intermediate step because you can actually keep that going on during intubation, give them that pre-oxygenation, give them that stenting, and then um, as they are suctioning out, and you're gonna have to suction a lot. So we do both yank hour suctioning and the uh, respiratory uh, suction catheter to get as much of those secretions out of there so you can get a good view of the cord when you're doing that. So a couple tips <clears throat> and some uh, things that are passe. <coughs> Steroids have not been shown to have any benefit. Uh, we'll still see quite a few kids getting transferred in having had steroids, but it does not help at all. Test activities actually are not um, very helpful routinely in uh, bronchiolitis, and so you can avoid that. <clears throat> and oftentimes, um, you know, we'll get transfers, and this is not shot at anybody, but just that you know, uh, kids are getting a lot of receptin, but it really doesn't help, especially if you have an X-ray that shows you know there's no pneumonia, so you can go ahead and skip that step. Remember, with bronchiolitis, you want to suction early, you want to suction often. Um, consider bronchodilators though in families that um, have a history of asthma and uh, consider it videos under three months. I know the guy before had mentioned uh, less than one month, and we definitely would admit for less than one month. Those are the highest risk, uh, but definitely uh, under three months also consider them because they are also at risk of progressing pretty quickly. And then keep in mind the time course. If you see a child in day two, day three of illness, that's gonna require a different approach than somebody that you're seeing on day six or seven of illness. Case number two. So you see a three-year-old with a history of eczema who was coming in with coughing and difficulty breathing for two days. Parents work the overnight shift, so grandma watches the child most nights, and <clears throat> she's noticed the cough as well, so she's been given the spoonfuls of honey and some OTC cough medicine, but not seeing any improvement. And over the last few nights especially, she said that it's gotten a lot worse. So she brings it on exam, you see a kid that's tachycardic, tachypnic, sat for 90%, blood pressure is a little bit elevated, and so, take a look at this child and you see that she's in moderate distress and the most important physical exam finding she's not playing with her toys. Um, if you see that, that should be a warning sign also. So you lift up the gown because you ask them to change into a gown, that's a big point. You want to look at the whole child and you see supersternal intercostal and subcostal retractions. But interestingly enough, you're not hearing much wheezing. Surprisingly for you, this kid is stat <coughs> status asthmatic. So asthma, very, very common disease. Um, here I have displayed several ways I've seen kids show me how they use their NDI. 
Yeah. Get up top and says, I had the Apple. And then uh, <laughs> if you're like me, a child of the 80s, you remember the Goonies. Every time that kid would get in trouble, he uses an inhaler, but no space there. What did that no space? I said, I get enough of the bag. Um, so for those in med school, this is old hack for you, for everybody else that's been out for a little while, just a quick review. So you got your triggers, you got your smokes, uh, your gases, your viral infections, weather changes, allergens, even emotional distress. That leads to a release of mediators from mast cells in the airway, and then eventually airway edema, plugging, and as well as um, air being trapped in the outer lab. As was the second most common thing we see at CHOA, um, both directly coming to us as well as uh, transfers in terms of respiratory illnesses. And despite it being a potentially reversible condition with multiple therapies, um, we still see a lot of morbidity and unfortunately some mortality. So you got your mild asthmatics. These kids look great, right? They've got no change in their respiratory effort, mild, maybe a little bit of tachypnea, but no nasal flaring, no grunting, no retractions. They might have that wet cough, some do that dry cough. We'll give them a trial of albuterol. <clears throat> so if they're under 15 kilos, we use 2.5 milligrams. If they're 15 kilos or greater, we'll go to five milligrams. <coughs> we can also do the um, MVI with the spacer, and we'll do between four and six puffs based on their size. And then just as the gentleman mentioned before, um, Decadron is what we've moved to. Um, I've been at CHOA now for seven years, and when we initially were, uh, when I was initially here, we started off with prednisone, and then over the last two years or so, we've been moving to Decadron. And just as they mentioned before, we give a dose in the ED, and then we actually have had an initiative for the last year to actually prepackage our Decadron tablets and hand it to them upon discharge so that we know that they're getting it. Um, and it's uh, just as effective as they mentioned before as the prednisone and uh, much, much better compliance. I have asthma, I still have a, um, a canister uh, or, uh, yeah, in, the, in my own pantry with uh, two more tablets of prednisone that I never finished. So if I don't finish it, you know the patient's not going to. Um, so the other thing about albuterol, right? So we, we typically, it's easy to slap the nebulizer mask on them, but there's actually some good studies that show that the MDI spacer is just as effective in these mild cases. And so this is a copy review from 2013. You can tell the British because they got the S in the nebulizer. And uh, they uh, show that you get actually no difference in hospital admission rates improved peak flow measurements after with the MDI and space to do less side effects like the tachycardia, the tremor, and you have decreased time to actually spend in the ED. I think it was three minutes to give the puffs versus 10 minutes to set up and give the nebulized solution. So uh, I, I don't know about you guys, but I always have family to say, uh, can you write me a prescription for the nebulized machine? And I actually show them, you know, this study that says, um, you know, you actually get much more benefit with this. It's more mobile, you can stick it in your, in your purse, in your book bag, anywhere you want to go and not feel about plugging it in. And so uh, that tends to help me sell the case to the family that the MDI and space that I'm giving them is just as effective. Of course, with anything, they can progress to the moderate ones. And so with these kids, they come into Kipnik for their age group. They've got nasal flaring, they've got grunting sometimes, and then they definitely have the retractions going on. With these kids, if you look at a lot of the studies, and even where I trained in Ohio, we did three back-to-back -back treatments initially um, with Atrivent, um, and then also the Dexatron. If that's not improving after the first hour, because it should take about an hour to get through all that, then you go to a continuous albuterol solution, <clears throat> where you have, for the less than 15 kilos, you're given 7.5 milligrams of albuterol. For the 15 or greater kilos, then you're given 15 milligrams. So 15 at 15. Um, in Atlanta, I have never seen asthma like this in my life before. It's on another level. So a lot of times when these kids come in with any kind of work or breathing, I don't even mess with intermittents. I just go straight to continuous. And so we, we pretty much routinely get children with uh, two rounds of continuous albuterol before they're starting to escalate to something even more. We use a lot of MAG. There's some people that don't believe in MAG. I'm a big believer in MAG. Um, we give a 50 mil a kilo bolus along with um, some isotonic fluids, whether that be LR or normal saline whatever you like. Um, and that helps with both the transient hypotension that comes along with the um, smooth muscle relaxation from the back sulfate. And also these kids have been breathing so fast, probably for at least a day, so they have a lot of increased and sensible losses, and so they help kind of fill up back the tank. And then systemic steroids. So you want to get them in early, right, in that first hour especially, because you know it's going to take at least four hours to get the concentration in the bloodstream where you need it to be. And so you can do the dexamethasone, as was mentioned before, um, the 0.6 per kilo, and we do the same thing. We often will crush the tablets and put it in a little slurry and give it to the kids. Um, 
And then you can also use methylprednisolone. So I know a lot of people see a lot of sick kids and then you want to jump to trying to get the IV and if you're struggling to get the IV, now you're not getting the, the, the steroid in them when you could have done the oral version. And this uh, study came, come up, uh, came up from the uh, National Asthma Guidelines that showed that there's really no difference in time to effectiveness of IV versus PO. The only thing that could limit you from doing the PO uh, version of the steroids is if the child is not either able to tolerate oral intake or they have some kind of gut motility issue. So those are not complicating factors. Go ahead and give them the PO because it's just as effective. And I went ahead and highlighted it for you, for you that have it on your uh, on your app. And that way, when you take it to uh, you know any committees at, at, at your shop, you can definitely push for it, advocate for it using this kind of data. And of course, we see really, really bad asthma. Like I said, I've never seen asthma like this before in my life, like I'm seeing in Atlanta, especially this, this season. Um, these kids come in looking sick, right? So they've got tachypnea. I don't care how old you are, it's tachypnea for anybody's age. They've got nasal pharynx, grunting. They've got significant retraction, and some of them have the dreaded silent chest. These kids, you're gonna bypass step one. You're not even gonna begin any back-to-backs. You're going straight to the, to the, to the the next step. So you're gonna call your respiratory therapist, collect all your equipment that you have, and head to the resuscitation room or trauma bay, whatever you call it, to start this full court press or kitchen sink approach. So these kids, um, like I said, if they're under 15 kilos, we give 7.5 milligrams. If they're greater than 15 kilos, we give 15 milligrams. They're not able to tolerate people if they're breathing this fast. So these kids are the ones that we will get the IV in them as soon as possible to so give them that lower dose of methylprednisolone. And if they're any boarding issues or having trouble getting them transported, just keep in mind that the next dose will be six hours later at 0.5 mg per kilo. We'll give them the max sulfate. If you look at Lexicon, it gives you this wide range of 25 mg per kilo to 75 mg per kilo. I usually go right down the middle and do 50. Um, and then also again with that normal saline or LR bolus. The other things that you can keep in your back pocket, I am epinephrine. So I've used this quite a bit. Um, we are in a unique position at, at Children's at Atlanta. We have three campuses. Two of them are kind of our motherships, and I'm mostly at our um, satellite location, which is kind of our outpost location. And it's, we see a good number of patients, about 60,000 a year, but we have no ICU support. We've got, I am the most senior physician in the hospital, so you guys might relate to that. And I have had several instances where, you know, the helicopter couldn't fly to come pick up this kid. It's, it's Atlanta, so there's traffic. Um, and then the bus is gonna be an hour or two before they can come and get the child. So I am epinephrine has really been a, a great bridge for me. Do 0 0.01 mix per kilo, so max of 0.5 mix per kilo. Anterior lateral side, there's some good data that shows that IM is a lot better than I uh, subcute in terms of uh, time to effectiveness by as much as about 18 minutes. So we do anterior lateral side. I remember I had a child, I gave three rounds of that while we were getting all, everything else teed up that I'm going to talk about. And um, that kid's initial blood gas was 6.9. 6 uh, PCO2 just read high, so I think it was greater than 95. And, uh, Three rounds of iron epinephrine got me to get him to our resuscitation room, got him on bypass, and then we were able to get him to the PICU where, you know, within 12 hours he was in the right, right location in terms of his, uh, his numbers in terms of pregnant birth. So iron epinephrine, I use it often. Ketamine, so some uh, few people have mentioned how much they love ketamine. I love ketamine. So ketamine, uh, we do a loading dose of 0.5 to 1 mg per kilo, um, and there's two reasons for that. One is that it helps them chill out. Right, because if you put a three-year-old on bypass, they'll have a very pissed three-year-old, and so that helps out with that. The other thing is it has a bronchodilatory effect, and so you help out with that as well. So I'll give them a point five just to make sure that you know they don't totally wig out on me and then I can't redirect them. Once I know that they're doing pretty well on that, then I'll continue them on a drip of one big per kilo per hour. And that's really, really helpful. Terbutaline, this rounds out our kitchen sink approach in terms of medications. Um, we do a loading dose between two to 10, and once again, I go right down the middle and do five mics per kilo, and then we get the drip to take it as you can start at 0.2 mics per, uh, mics per kilo per minute. In terms of um, getting this all prepared, if your shop has EMR that allows adult ordicents, I think that is an excellent thing to do. That way you're not trying to remember these doses, not trying to remember which medicines you can have available. You can just have it readily available like I have here. Um, you can't really see that well, I don't think, but um, on the left side we have all of our medications um, that we initially talked about for the moderate kids, and then on the right side we've got all the extras there, including the non-invasive ventilation settings. 
So in terms of respiratory support, we mentioned before high flow nasal cannula, and so we can go up to the membrane to as high as 20 liters per minute, but then bypass. We definitely will put uh, the bigger kids, and for us, bigger is you know, older than three, uh, on bypass, and you just have to make sure that you're setting the settings up the right and setting. <laughs> so you want to have a low IDP ratio, so one to three between that and one to five. Um, we also use a lot of heliops. We actually have it piped into almost every room. Like I said, we have asthma to be really bad. So if you have a kid that's not moving really good here, heliops and 80 to 20 mixture, there's also 70 to 30. So if you use the 80 to 20, um, helps kind of get that hair where it needs to be. Remember, helium is a lighter density um, gas, and so it allows for a more laminar flow, so you're not dealing with all the turbulence trying to get down to those distal airways. And so we use a lot of heliops. I've had kids where we could not get good ventilation going, start them on heliops doing some IM epinephrine, and then you start to hear some breath sounds. And so it's been a real um, lifesaver for a lot of our kids. And then endotracheal intubation. So this one always gives us pause, right? Because these kids are the ones that will try to code on you as you try to intubate them. So a couple of things we always keep in mind. You want to fill up their tank. Like I said before, these kids have a lot of insensible losses. They've got a lot of intrathoracic pressure, so their venous deterrence and venous pressure is not ideal. So you're going to tank them up. So we'll give them, I'll give them at least a 20 per kilo bolus, and if I can get enough time in there and we're pushing fluids, you know, hand pushing, then I'll try to get them 40 mLs per kilo into their system before I prepare for this, before I actually proceed with the intubation. We use a lot of ketamine for these kids because, like I said before, you're going to get that bronchodilatory effect. So it's going to get them to chill out enough. I use a minimum of two mix per kilo. Our cardiologists, when they complete, are very aggressive with the ketamine. They do four mix per kilo because they love how um, it doesn't depress the cardiac output for their kids. And then we use something cold because it's um, shorter acting than the usual rock that we use. And then once you do get them intubated, you want to start off with low tidal volumes, um, low respiratory rate, and then ramp it up as needed. And then if you're fortunate enough to have anesthesia um, close by and you get them intubated, then ask them for some isoflurane. There's some really good studies that show that um, improves uh, time on the ventilator, meaning that they have decreased time for ventilatory assistance and then time of discharge on them once they're put on the ISO floor. So some lessons learned. You have to be really cautious with these kids, right? If you have um, any child that's in respiratory distress, hit them hard, hit them fast. Fast and furious, right? Because these kids will try to tank on you very quickly. And remember, it's all about the effort. So don't be fooled by a quiet child. Sometimes that quiet child is secretly decompensating right in front of you. And don't be fooled also if you're not hearing much wheezing initially because sometimes they're just so clamped down once you start getting the meds in them, you start opening up and then you start to hear that, that wheezing going on all throughout the um, respiratory exam. Big, big thing is stress to the families that if anything changes, don't be afraid to come back. I give all my families, I said, if this child gets worse, don't think of it as a failure. Think of it as you recognizing that your child's getting worse and I will give you a white coat when you come back because you are being a good doctor if I bring them back to you. And so once you empower them like that, they, they feel a lot more confident and are quick to come back before things get too bad because now you kind of key them into the concept of progression of the disease. And that's all I have, guys. Okay. And that's the one that had the bronchitis. <laughs>